really happy. Um, this is kind of a, a long work with a long story, so I'm glad that you're, you're here to share it. My lecture recital is all about a pedagogical guide to a song cycle, Abide With Me, written by Price Walden in 2015, just a few years ago. Um, we'll talk more about Price later, but this music is gorgeous and special, and, and I can't wait to share it with you, and hopefully you'll share it with your students as well. With more access to recently composed art songs, it's important to find ways to pedagogically incorporate this repertoire into the voice studio. How can we do that with new works? My, my project, my work here, was all about uh, analyzing these songs from a pedagogical perspective uh, to help teachers understand these songs and know what kind of students they might be appropriate for. We always want repertoire to address challenges that students are facing in their voice. And we want not just technical exercises, but repertoire that addresses those same things. Using elements of several vocal pedagogy resources, I created kind of a, a guide to help my analysis uh, for when each of these songs can be assigned individually. Price Walden, as I said, is a, a friend of mine. Uh, we grew up together kind of in, in Mississippi. Uh, he is a, a homosexual composer, a queer composer, I believe they identify as at this point. Um, but he grew up in Boonville, Mississippi, which is in the top right up there, and I grew up in Olive Branch, Mississippi, which is the top left, and we kind of met in the middle in Oxford, Mississippi, at the University of Old Miss. So how do we create this pedagogical guide? The first of the resources that I spent a lot of time with was Clifton Ware's Basics of Vocal Pedagogy from 1998. To facilitate learning a new song, Ware talks about analyzing uh, components of the song, component analysis, and among these elements are the text, the rhythm, the meter, and the tempo, the melody and key, the form. He just randomly says vocal elements, not super helpful, we dive into that a little later. Um, the harmonic language of the song and any articulation, kind of diction, things that we talk about. A uh, resource that kind of builds on those themes and adds a couple others is Art Song in the United States, um, which Professor Johnson back there introduced me to. Thank you for that. Um, here we include the poet, the length of the work, and any special difficulties which uh, really turns into accessibility things, um, which we, again, we'll talk about a little bit more later. The last resource that I spent a, a whole ton of time with in developing this pedagogical guide was uh, Christopher Arneson's Literature for Teaching. I think this book is fabulous, and it, it really goes through songs and kind of grades them on a, a scale of beginner to advanced um, with, with a lot of areas in between. Um, but he, his, his component analysis goes a little deeper into the vocal side, um, those vocal elements that we talked about in the where. Um, he talks about the range, the tessitura, any ornamentation or repetition found in the voice and the melodic line, the melodic intervals, phrase length, how the text is set, how accessible emotionally is the text, um, how supportive is the piano, does the piano double the vocal line, does it support or is it fairly independent, and then any melismatic content 
in the vocal line. Using those things that Arneson talks about, he develops these five technical goals for evaluating repertoire. Breathing, phonation, registration, articulation and text, and expression. Expression, I think, is, is the most novel of these in terms of a pedagogical perspective. Um, the expression is the language used. Is it language that we use today, or is it Shakespearean English? Is it Goethe? Those kinds of things. Um, I think that using these, I, well, I don't think I'm telling. Using these, uh, I created kind of my approach to how these songs can be evaluated. These evaluations enable the teacher to select a song that addresses those student challenges that we talked about earlier. Arneson outlines how several of these technical goals can be assessed through song literature. Read it. I'm not going to read it to you. Read it. It's great. Um, I think the most important thing that he talks about here is selecting songs that are appropriate, and that's the, the goal of all of this, right? So, what elements did I choose to focus on? I chose to focus on registration, on breathing, how those elements work in the vocal line, any rhythmic and melodic elements, is it fairly simple, do we switch from simple to compound meters within a song, elements like that, um, melodic elements, the biggest leaps in there, are they across the passaggio, uh, the harmonic style and whether the piano supports that or whether it's fairly independent, like we said, and the accessibility. So let's talk about the music. The first movement of Abide With Me is That Night, and it uses text from Walt Whitman's sonnet, When I Heard at the Close of the Day. It doesn't use all the text, but I believe that all the text is represented through the music. The first thing we'll talk about is registration. The registration is fairly accessible. These songs were written for piano and tenor voice, so all of this is fairly accessible in the tenor voice. The vocal line barely pushes the comfortable range for a tenor, arriving at that top of the staff F4 once with ascending stepwise patterns. Interestingly, there are two instances of a melismo rising to this E flat, where we have the beautiful day. Where's my laser pointer? There it is. The beautiful day and the moon's clear being shown approached very differently, one through a leap, one through a half-step rise. These provide two di very different approaches to the low edge of the tenor passaggio, allowing the singer to apply the lessons that they're learning in their technical exercises. The phrasing throughout the song and the resulting breath indications make the song very accessible. Many of the phrases are long, but they're always easy places to add a breath. Easy rests, long notes that you can cut off, usually indicated by a comma, anytime you can take a breath. The rhythm and melody, the rhythm kind of fights between the piano and the vocal line every once in a while. We have duples on triples and triples on duples in various places. And the vocal line shifts back and forth between these dotted eights and the regular eights of the, the triplet beat. The tempo is dotted quarter equals 50. 
that's a pretty common tempo marking in the cycle because it allows for a rhythm of speech to come through in the quality of the text. But it's slow enough for a singer to really need to reinforce those legato lines throughout. You can't just speak. There has to be constant motion in the breath. The melodic contour is mostly stepwise, and there are many notes which are repeated with changing text, we see here. And we need to use the diction to reinforce that legato. The largest melodic interval, interval is a descending perfect fifth, and there are no real extensive melismatic moments. The harmony of this song can be tricky. I think it's the most difficult part of the song, uh, the most difficult component of the song, we could say, as the key areas that are utilized never really coalesce into a real key, into a real key signature. However, the song never feels as though it lacks tonality. It's never atonal. The ternary structure of the piece seems to make it fairly accessible, but the piano is very independent of the vocal line, lowering its accessibility greatly. In terms of emotional accessibility, I'm going to have to take a step back and say this might be the most difficult part. It's difficult in terms of expression and accessibility, especially in these extended piano introductions and the, the outro, really, in developing character, developing those lines of the sonnet that are not present in the vocal line. The singer must find ways to interpret and portray this material while the emotional extreme of joy may be easy to present, the emotions within each section may be a little bit more difficult. The anxiousness that we ask for in measure 33 must stay under control and not disrupt the legato of the voice and the settling and savoring that's indicated later in the song must be shown while staying on the support, the apadjo, finding a balance between extending the vowels but maintaining this speech-like quality. The difficulties of this first movement rise really from character building and the independence of the piano. If a student has a good ear and can hang on to melodies, maybe it's forgiving enough to be appropriate for a late beginner, a sophomore. But really, if, if we're worried about pitch and remembering these melodies, I think that this is more appropriate for a late intermediate singer, a junior, a senior. We'll talk about one more, and then we'll get into some music. The second movement, In the Garden, is um, based on a C. Austin Miles hymn text. Um, we might know that song, I come to the garden. If you don't, that's okay. Start reading. <laughs> Contain yourself back there, Professor Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> When we take this, my goodness. When we take this hymn text and uh, Price has written a whole new uh, melody and, and harmonized it while still keeping many of those hymn elements throughout. The registration of the song prevents, again, just a few challenges for the tenor voice. The vocal range is pretty small, just a little over an octave from that. E3 to the F4, with a tessitura below the passaggio between F and D. The melodic line is fairly easy, again, hymn-like. has mostly stepwise motion and skips that are both tonal and normally cadential. 
there are some tricky moments in the passaggio. We have this D to F to E motion in two places, here and here, that kind of leap into the passaggio and then descend through can be a little tricky. We do the music three times through to accommodate three verses in the chorus. So a student has six shots at it. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully they get all six. Maybe they don't. But that's okay. The, I think the fact that it repeats is much more accessible than having a different approach to it every time. Again, this song for beginners. Totally. Totally for beginners. The breathing is extremely accessible. Four bar phrases used throughout, and these phrases come in sentence pairs, creating an opportunity for a, a teacher to, to talk about carrying over energy from phrase to phrase to complete the textual thought. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. Carrying the energy through that is a valuable tool for a beginner. The rhythm is simple, traditional, 2-2, two -two, him, simple. Again, we're around half note equals 50. Speech-like quality is imperative. The melody is written with fairly regular pitch arcs, with the exception coming when each verse rides into the chorus on a big half cadence. The chorus repeats verbatim on the page. No new text. You know how the chorus works. Reinforcing this idea of the hymn. The largest melodic interval is a descending major six, but this interval easily fits into both the melodic and the harmonic context. The song is in the C major area throughout. The only possible challenge coming around these measures, in measure 13, we have this Neapolitan chord that comes in. But that A flat up in measure 10 is in the piano, the whole bar. So the singer can hear it, internalize it, and then come to sing it. It doesn't have to just come out of nowhere. The expressive challenge in this song comes through giving some character development and emotional contrast during each verse. The emotions vary, vary from confidence to comfort to longing. And the singer must be able to portray the subtle differences within those emotions. Overall, the origins of Miles' text are seen throughout the song, with many elements that reinforce the hymn-like structure. The simplicity of many of the technical elements makes this song invaluable to use as a tool with beginning students. I use it with mine. So now, with the fabulous Jenny Snyder, we will perform these first two movements. First, I'm going to drink some water. You can too. <laughs> You've had my permission. I'm so sorry we don't have mood lighting. Mm
so good. Let's go on. Movement three. Be not afraid. The cycle's middle movement here is again based on a Walt Whitman poem <clears throat> as Adam early in the morning. The song is a prelude to a, a voiceless expression of physical love during the attached interlude. The character of the cycle is shown convincing his partner to join him for a moment of intimacy. And the tension of the subject matter is reflected in the heightened difficulty of the song. The song registration sits higher than the previous movements with a range of C3 to G4 above the staff and an effective tessitura of G3 right in the middle of the staff to E flat. The melody contains mostly stepwise motion but there are several substantial skips incorporated into the vocal line as well. The first of these skips, here in measure 13, Behold Me, is set quite well and should present no memory challenges for a student. The second of these skips, in measure 33, is the end of the cycle and I find that it's much more challenging. It's not supported in the piano line. You're actually in direct competition with the B and the C. It does mirror the action of this dramatic text, though, so a teacher can present it as a reflection of that text. There are extended phrases in the passaggio which are exposed in musical texture by minimal piano activity. An example is here in measures 15 and 16. Hear my voice. It should be in that range. Hear my voice. Beautiful tenor voice. It should be set there. We understand why. Only a singer with fluid navigation of the passaggio should be assigned this song. The song takes a dramatic jump in difficulty. The breathing structure of the song is irregular. There's no pattern. We have both extensions and text repetitions with make, which make the phrases asymmetrical. However, the breaths are all clearly evident, mostly occurring during rests in the vocal line as Adam early in the morning. You can choose to breathe there, you can choose not to, but the opportunity is there. The rhythm and the melody, the piece is in common time with a gentle tempo to accommodate the text. For Price, music is a vehicle for text delivery. The melodic contours are a blend of nice arcs and directional upwards momentum making it easy for the singer to find how the energy flows from one phrase to another. There are some textual and melodic repetitions which are used both for elaboration and for dramatic intent. The largest interval is the major six that we talked about in measure 13, and it skips over the passaggio to create a simple harmony with the piano. There's one small, accessible melisma right towards the end in measure 30 used to convey the tension of that moment. There's a descending melodic ostinato in the right hand of the piano right up there until measure 21. Provides an unstable tonal center, but again, there's no firmly defined key throughout. The tonal content of this song for the voice is the most challenging element, and the composer, the composer utilizes the concept of density to play with the listener's notion of consonance versus dissonance. When we're more sparse, we think it would be more consonant, and it's not. It's when we get more voices 
in this bottom system here that we start to hear more consonant harmonies. The song is through composed, purely text driven, and the piano is fairly independent from the vocal line, sometimes using the notes found in the voice, but never really giving much support, acting instead as a secondary character. The expressive challenge of the song is that the singer must create the scene for the audience and incorporate this silent partner. We never hear from the other man in the room. We sense their willingness, their hesitation, but we never actually hear from them. The emotions of confidence and reassurance play major roles in character development, but the singer must be careful to present these honestly so that the character comes off as genuine and not manipulative. The sexual nature of the text and the resulting interlude require a high level of emotional maturity. Overall, Be Not Afraid is a much more difficult song which demands advanced techniques in passaggio management, text delivery, and independence of the vocal line. These elements together make this song appropriate for late intermediate to advanced level singers. You know, those good seniors, those grad students. Connecting three and four, we have this interlude, Night, which is, again, the musical expression of that act of physical love over 22 measures. We go straight into the fourth movement, Be Not Afraid. This movement also uses the hymn text of um, Abide With Me. That's why there's no quotation marks, because that's supposed to say Abide With Me. <laughs> I'm going to find whoever did that. <laughs> we have thoughts here. The text was written in 1847, again it is Abide With Me, by Henry Francis Light, another hymn tune, but again, Price has taken it and written a whole new melody and, and harmonization for it. We emerge from the texture of the interlude, connecting through the continued use of this cadential movement, this cadential figure found in the left hand of the piano. You'll hear it in the interlude. You'll hear it at the beginning of the fourth movement. The registration challenges are mostly a factor of the low for a tenor, again, the low range. We go down to the C flat, but we get all the way up to the G flat. The tessitura, however, sits in a comfortable range from F to E flat, leaving the voice to incorporate as many colors as possible. The text is much more varied in emotions, we go from pleading, but we engage that pleading on a personal sense, on a divine sense, on a universal sense throughout the movement. The vocal line contains steps and small skips, but does have two occurrences of the tritone, both of which are supported in the piano. There's one phrase in the passaggio found in measures 15 through 17 here. Others fail and comforts flee. A repetition of that text set higher in the voice to bring it out a little farther. But this phrase is set up with a good breath and is written to be easily achieved by the singer. There are no real challenges with breathing in this movement. It's important to note that the phrases are still irregular, meaning the singer cannot create a regular breathing pattern, just bumping up that difficulty a little bit. All breaths are taken by shortening held notes here, or over a rest here. The rhythmic and melodic elements are the truly challenging parts here. 
and do require an advanced sand. The meter shifts, but it's all felt in half notes throughout. These, or these changing time signatures do not look easy on the page, and it would take time for a young singer to be able to negotiate these changes in rhythm with a natural feel. The slow tempo and incorporation of plenty of rubato throughout create an elongated feeling with about six measures of a driving restlessness right here in this section. The melodic contours of each phrase are unpredictable and exacting. The titular text occurs several times, and this pleading takes many varied motions throughout the movement. The harmonies have moments of E flat minor, but the harmony really just kind of planes around. This is about as impressionistic as we get in this music. The unstable nature of the tone of the tonality further contributes to the difficulty. The song is through composed with a vocal line and piano trading momentum throughout sections. But there are still some moments that have a strong cadential feel. The piano is independent and mostly lives in its own space and tonal world, but there are moments where they're joined together, trading voices to create a chain of propulsion throughout the text. The expressive demands of this song are intense emotions of pleading and abandonment, both of which require honesty and desperation from the singer. The subject matter requires the finesse of a skilled interpreter with emotional maturity. The ethereal nature of this song is highlighted by the interplay between the voice and the piano. The musical and expressive content of the song requires an advanced singer in terms of independence, contour challenges, and the gravity of the text. We're looking at master students here. Our last song, bear with me, we're almost there. Our last song, If You Will Have Me, is a poem written by um, contemporary writer Philip Rice. Um, Price and Philip are friends. I've never met Philip, but I've read most of his poetry. It's gorgeous. This poem comes from a 2014 collection titled, What It Means to Fall. The registration of this song poses no demanding challenges with a range of D-flat to E-flat and a tessitura of E-flat to B-flat. This low tessitura keeps the voice in its speaking range and encourages the use of a light voix mix in the rare moments above the, the fifth of that tessitura. Hello. My student is the one who's late. <laughs> I'm sure he was at someone else's recital. Glad you're here. The composer uses mostly stepwise motion with frequent perfect fourth movements and two major six descents. Passaggio is avoided entirely. It's not where the challenge of the song comes through. The breathing is really tied to the delivery of the text. The phrase lengths are highly irregular, following, following no pattern, but the breaths are accessible throughout and all occur, again, over rests or by shortening longer notes. The meter of the song is a constant 4-4. The comfort and accessibility of the song end there, however. The frequent switching between duples and triples in the vocal line is quite challenging. And the tempo is fractured from the beginning with the use of these ad libitum, 16th note descents in the piano. That's the note that we see at the beginning. The tempo does not necessarily solidify with the entrance of the voice, but 
it allows for a conversational flow to the text. The melodic contour often makes a nice arc over two phrase groupings, those sentence groupings that we saw in the second movement. Some of these groupings end with an upward gesture, which can be challenging for a singer. These elements facilitate the singer's interpretation of the text, however. The, larger, the largest melodic intervals are these descending major sixth, found in measures 23, and again in 32. And these serve as a good test for the singer to see that they're not driving the sound so that the low register can be accessed with freedom. There are some small melismatic moments which serve to emphasize the text, but those in and of themselves are not difficult. The music presents moments of an E flat minor again. We hint at E flat minor, but this tonality is never firmly uh, established. Interestingly, this movement incorporate, incorporates elements of earlier movements with melodic ostinati in measures 9 through 12 and 15 through 18 in sections of tonal planing, this impressionist style again. The song is through composed giving a feeling of rumination without a strong conclusion in the text, in the vocal line, in the piano line. The piano is rarely settled in tonality or tempo, and it often clashes with the vocal line. Here we see the piano just around the vocal pitches. Maybe the voice is around the piano pitches. You can make both arguments. The singer must be able to showcase the extreme emotion of vulnerability throughout the song with a sincere honesty and an innocence that's driven by this chain of metaphors. As trees have leaves, as moons have shining, as a woman has a child, as stars have gravity. The emotions involve brittleness, warmth, and darkness. And the text cycles through all these emotions, again, without coming to a conclusive thought. The emotional maturity required is not too complex. The complication comes from the honesty that's required. The last song of this cycle does not present many vocal challenges, but the mind of the singer will be extremely challenged with the ever-shifting tonalities and rhythms, which are coupled to the fiercely vulnerable honesty in the text. These demands make the song appropriate or again, a late intermediate singer who's looking for a work to challenge both their mind and their audience. Now we'll sing and play again the fabulous chant. <laughs> I'm going to drink first. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure this is just water, but Alex filled it up, so I don't <laughs> <laughs> Touch me 
one that was particularly obvious to me, at least in all the excerpts that you showed, are there, there are no dynamic markings anywhere. In fact, there was only one day crescendo over the E flat of the, in the Bible view. Right. So why do you think that is? And because I, I view those things as interpretive guidelines for um, the singers, and without anything, uh, I'm just wondering if you would speak to that a little bit. Sure. I think that um, <clears throat> there are more dynamic markings in the piano, and, and the singer um, can either follow those or not. I think that, for the most part, all of that, um, the dynamics for the singers are, are driven by the text, whether it's a bold moment in the poem that requires a little more volume, a little more size to be heard, or whether it's a sweeter moment in the poetry. And I think that the nice thing about that is it, it can be challenging for a young singer to kind of decide these things. Um, but for an advanced singer, for me, I think it gives the singer so much more freedom in how they choose to express the dynamics throughout. I think that um, the other factor in that is just the density of what's happening in the piano below you um, influence that, especially in the third movement. When we get into touch me and we have three lines of piano that's really a big chord and then interlocking harmonies above that um, requires a much more bombastic presence from the singer. But I think that that's a, a great question, and I, I hope I answered it for you. Yes, so you're saying that there's a lot more dynamic markings, because in none of the excerpts that we saw were there dynamic markings either in the piano or in the vocal line, but in the, in the complete score, there are more vocal, uh, are there are more dynamic markings in the piano. In the piano, yes. Okay, the other question I have is, what, looking at what we saw, and by the way, I thought you sang it beautifully, and I think your interpretation of it is it was a beautiful interpretation. However, I think there are the possibilities of other interpretations. Absolutely. And would there be any reason, I mean, you mentioned right away that it's written for tenor and that he is a queer mm -hmm. composer, but is there any reason, there's certainly not any um, tessitura or range reason that Mezzo's for example, wouldn't be very comfortable singing this. And, and we sing lots of music like, that we portray <laughs> ourselves in a more masculine, I mean, right. uh, way. So I'm just curious, of what are your thoughts about, and, and as if, if there was a woman singing it, I think some of the things that you interpreted as being very tender and delicate might be interpreted uh, in a more, uh, in a bigger, more dramatic way. So I just wonder if you had considered any of that or... Absolutely. Um, so, again, Christ is a friend of mine and uh, all his music kind of gets passed around our group of friends. Um, this song cycle has been recorded by um, mezzos, by sopranos, um, by adventurous baritones. <laughs> uh, you know, it... it it's for who wants to sing it. Um, I, I think that exactly what you're talking about, there is a certain interpretation from a, a tenor of bass who identifies as male, who interprets it a certain way that would be different. Um, and there's some of it that the second movement there's no sexual nature to that, so it could be anyone. Again, playing into that, that hymn setting of it, it's for everyone. Great, I, I'm glad to hear that because I think that is a really interesting piece and very, uh, I like the poetry and I particularly like the, the Adam 
you know, be not afraid. Yeah. I particularly like that, and I think it could be presented from uh, male, female, male, male, female, female, you know, uh, or all the other things that I'm trying to learn about. So, and uh, so I'm glad to hear that. And I, the, the only thing that I don't know um, that I'd have to talk to Price about would be um, changing the, the pronouns in the music to where it could be she throughout. Right. I don't think that I would be know. necessary, though, because yeah. let's look at when we sing Schubert songs or Schumann yeah. songs right. and, or any kind of love song. And, <laughs> you know, I think I encourage my students to, to envision the, the object of their affection, not yeah. necessarily the gender that maybe is, is in the pronouns. Absolutely. And then, you know, we put on a character when we perform, so... You know, there's all those things in it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir? Stretch. Very interesting topic of conversation with, with all of this. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think twice about uh, when I, I, I read poetry every day. And I read, I read poetry by women. I read poetry by men. I read poetry of no matter what their, 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 their sexual you know, preferences are. Um, and yet... Uh, when we sing, when, when this topic comes up about, well, can a, can a man sing this, you know, or can a woman sing this, and it, what are your thoughts on that? Because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't even enter into the, into the minds of people who are, if I got up and I wanted to read a po poetry by Mary Oliver or Allen Ginsberg, it doesn't, what does it, I'm not even, it's not even my interpretation, I am you know, we are, we, are, we are putting out into the world the right. thoughts of that particular poet. Yeah. Whether I'm, you know, male, female, asexual, unisexual, what are your thoughts? I, you know, I think that it, it kind of ties into uh, what we were talking about in the round table earlier where we said, you teach the voice, you present the poetry, you present the ideas, how you know there, there's a range of of would the poet appreciate different interpretations of it? Uh, would the composer appreciate different interpretations? And for a lot of things, we can just say as the performer, I understand that this is where you're coming from, but I'm going to do it my way this way. And I think that all of it is, is valid as long as you can justify it. I think that when we come to things like that, it's important that we just have the conversation with ourselves, that we've thought about those things. Whenever I walk into, uh, uh, not walk into, but I, I read literature with homosexuals or any kind of queer thing, I see it for what it is and what the intention was, and then I can read it in my own way. I think that honest interpretations of things have to involve the source and what the, the original purpose was, and then we can move around that as we, as we want, really. I hope that answers your question. I wasn't looking for an answer, I was looking for your thoughts. <laughs> Those are my thoughts. <laughs> Good luck. It's all for Christine Schaefer saying, um, I should do that, and Darren was saying, I'm proud to do it for me. You know, one other thing I would ask, and you did a beautiful job, I agree with, with Professor Redman, you beautiful, um, and, and, and really difficult to maintain uh, over a long uh, length of time uh, uh, and keep it very taut and keep us interested um, in music that, that really kind of just sits in a certain languid uh, uh, air, you know, area for a long length of time. That being, that's a challenge in itself for someone. Um, and have you given thoughts to what would be paired with this on a 
concert because it's going to require a whole another level of virtuosity to sustain rhythmic vitality in order to counter what we just heard. Um, I haven't thought about programming it with something else um, just for just for aesthetics. Um, I had originally planned on doing another song cycle with this for the lecture recital, but it turned out to be way too much music. Um, I, from an aesthetic standpoint, I haven't really considered it. I think that I think that there are so many ways that you could go about it. It really depends on the student and and what their mental capabilities are, whether they can sustain another set of this mood of this type, or whether they need some more structure. Uh, it's hard to say without knowing specifically who it would be for. But, but also for the audience, because right. the audience mm -hmm. doesn't want to hear a whole mm -hmm. name, I don't think, of melancholy, or, you know, right. um, so I think that would be a consideration as much as the ability of the student. Absolutely.